Yes, Great. good to go. All right, good very good. No problem. Good, wonderful. So basically, I'm recording as well. So recording has started also, right? Well, welcome to our session today. Today is, well, first of all, before we get into our classes, I don't know if you guys are aware, but we got an extension until June, all right? Um, that's a big extension, typically, it, it compared to what students would normally get, right? So let's use it to our advantage. Just making sure all of you are aware of the extension until the early, early June. Is that a yes? Yes, got the email. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Yes, yes, excellent. Wonderful. No. Ideally, what I'll do as well, like, so today I'll do two, two of the, the chapters, and then after that, depending on the nature and size of the other chapters, I'll just do one at a time, given we have a lot more, uh, a bit of time to play. Um, at the same time, guys, use the time to your advantage, and the fact that for some of you, this may not be as a busy period for some of you, for others, it may be even busier than usual. But let's use that time as well to see how much you can get done also, all right? Okay. So today we're going to look at risk. Now, before we get started with this section as well, some of you may have, I would have emailed you before. And for those of you who Mina is your supervisor, she may have also shared with you um, a document from Ghani. So I would have sent it to you before along with a link to all Ghani's videos, right? I would encourage you to look at those videos as well and also work along with what I have. They are, there's a whole lot of overlapping in both, but there are also some uniqueness to Ghani's approach as well, compared to mine. And the fact is you could use the best of all of them. So I don't want you to ever feel confused over which one. If ever you get to the point, if, if ever you get to the point of feeling confused about which one you should do or use, just leave with me. But the reality is that the content is the same, how you put it together might be subtly different from one versus the other. So before we get into our section called risk, I want to look at the report sent to you from Ghani. This year, I would have sent early on along with links to YouTube videos as well. Um, it's a final report structure, the final project report structure from Ghani. And in it, he had, at the beginning, he had his title page, table of contents, right? Okay, if you want your pictures, image, content, that is optional. Then you have your introductory section, right? And in your introductory section, you do your project background and project introduction. Then you do your problem statement and functional requirements. So just a note how ours are a little bit different. Ghani includes the functional requirements over here in this section here. We have an entire chapter devoted to functional requirements, right? Now, if you follow most of the textbook, etc., functional requirements is a chapter that typically goes after the background research. Ghani lists his functional requirements up early, right? So, given that's the case, right, I, I have a separate section for functional requirements. The choice is yours if you choose to put your functional requirements here or if you choose to list them in a separate section in, in, in the relevant chapter that I have. Good. So I'm going to actually, I'm going to split screen. This side will have Ghani's report, right? This side will have the report structure that I would have recommended. So this is report structure for mine. Ghani's over here. So notice here now, we have a chapter one introduction. I have a chapter one introduction. All right. Um, let's see if I, there's an option for a pointer as well. Right. So I'll just use the spotlight so in terms of the spotlight so this is introduction here and this is introduction here so we both have an introduction what is contained in, in the introduction is very similar except that Ghani has functional requirements so i'm highlighting where he has functional requirements uh, as within within the introduction chapter whereas we have functional requirements over here requirements analysis is your functional requirements right so requirements analysis is your functional requirements. So it's over here, all right? Um, again, all you have to do, you don't have to feel confused, just choose one and work with it. You're not gonna lose marks ness or anything like that. You, once you have the content, that's most critical, good? All right, next. The rest of it, we more or less have the same chapter, right? Now, the next thing is after that, so section two, we have, Literature review here, that's what Ghani has. Our chapter two is background research, which is your literature review. So literature review or background research, as Ghani say, whatever you call it, same thing here, right? Chapter three, legal, social, ethical. 
chapter three, legal, social, ethical, professional issues. However, right, what Ghani has here now, you notice within chapter three as 3.5, Ghani has project risk as a subset of LSEP. Now LSEP, the heading is called LSEP, right? And well, he also include risk issues in the heading, right? What I've simply done, because I'm basically trying to treat each as a separate section, risk is a separate chapter, right? So what he has as 3.5 risk, I have as a separate chapter on risk. Which one is correct? They are both correct. You simply choose where you want to put it. If you want to leave it as a subsection or you put it as a separate report. What I've simply done is simply separate each thing. So if I'm dealing with risk, I'm only dealing with risk. When I'm dealing with LSCP, I'm dealing only with LSCP. How you combine it after is your choice. Good? Um, so I don't want anyone to... to it's often easy for a student to claim that, look, hey, well, this is too confusing. The two of them conflicting each other. No, we're not. We just may have slightly different opinion on where it goes, but most important, it is included in the report. What we simply detailing is if when you're writing, what should you include when you're discussing risk or what should you just include when you're discussing requirements, etc. And that is what this is going to focus on, right? Then Ghani goes on to design, right? As is chapter four. Now remember, we have our requirements. So this is where my requirements come in, comes in. Ghani, so my, my chapter after risk is requirements. Ghani, Ghani had his requirements in chapter one. After that though, Ghani goes on to design. We have a design phase, which is chapter six. Then Ghani goes on to implementation, right? Implementation. Right, we have software, the implementation phase here in chapter seven. Ghani goes on out to testing. He call it experimentation and testing. We have testing and then we have evaluation, which is evaluation of the software, right? So we have more or less the same thing. Terminology may be slightly different. Where there's a slight discrepancy, Ghani calls project evaluation as the last chapter right? So that's his project evaluation. But if you look at what it discusses, it discusses evaluation, research evaluation, met, um, artifact evaluation, future development, etc. right? That is included in my conclusion chapter. So my conclusion chapter really is what Ghani called his project evaluation. So all these things Ghani discusses here in his project evaluation will be in the conclusion chapter. What software evaluation is, Software evaluation is really an evaluation of the interface from a design perspective, where the same way where you test, you test to determine if the functions are working properly. The, the evaluation is an evaluation of the design, if it was well designed. So basically, this is the user experience part of it, right? So you could have merged that with testing and evaluation, right? But we have it as separate chapters. Good. And Ghani chapter. Final chapter is conclusion. Well, I call it conclusion. He calls it project evaluation. Different terms, but we're speaking the same language. Good. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's look a bit in terms of what the risks are. So if you look at what Ghani note says about the risk, Ghani says here, so I'm focusing on Ghani's notes. He said, talk about the risk that the project face. Don't make it very basic. Talk about proper risk that could have contributed to the failure of the project. As always, if you're unsure, read about it. Don't just talk off the top of your head that things might be right. Reading more about the subject helps a lot. Now, that's the note there for project risk. Let's give it, let's now, this section that I'm going to do now is going to focus in greater detail about the risk now associated with your project. So our lecture begins now specifically on risk. So in terms of, well, before we get into that, let's talk about our word for today. And our word for today is the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but really on building the new. And in terms of what we're all facing today, guys, with COVID-19, you know, a lot is changing. We are welcoming and ushering ourselves into the new, right? And the fact is, is that this new is what our children are going to talk about. We are, we are, we are I don't know if to call it well esteemed to have been part of this experience where we switch from old to new. But the fact is, is that this disease has changed lives. It has changed the way we work. We operate as well. Some of us are fighting to get back to the old and some of us are, are fighting to build a new, the new well, norm, if you want to call it that. So the reality is that instead of fighting, focusing only on the old, let's focus on building the new. All right. 
so let's get into to today's section on risk. Now, the good thing about risk and this chapter is you would have done this entire thing before in your project proposal in the project planning module. So a lot of it is simply rehashing what you've done before. What does that mean? You could reuse the entire risk section you had completed before in when you did your project um, proposal, or you can use the feedback that you got, look at the mark and enhance it. Enhance it now to include things that you may have overlooked, et cetera, all right? So in terms of risk, let's just talk at the high level because the fact is you may have gone through this before. So I'm gonna to try to make it a little bit more discussion oriented as well. All right, so from your perspective now, now that you have started the project, we no longer in project proposal where you have no idea what you're getting into or maybe just some idea. Now that you're actually doing this project here, what you consider guys to be some of the, the risk, sorry. So what, what are you guys considering to be the risk that you all, are, you all um, believe are impacting your project? So if you don't mind sharing, right, let me just pull this a little bit smaller here, decide. Okay, Baris, you wanna start sharing about some of the risks that you actually seeing happening since you started the project or any particular risk? Time, um, time is one in terms of um, completing on time. I think that's a big risk because I'm on, probably overestimates. So I underestimate the amount of um, work that I might need to, to do in terms of learning the code and stuff. I would only be able to take in more into consideration. But now actually, I actually adjusted my project to suit to try and mitigate some of those. Um, no problem. Now, just to talk about it, when you started the project proposal, time was a big constraint. Maybe a few weeks ago, time was a huge constraint because some of you probably felt you're not going to consider to finish this on time. Now, yeah. one of the things you're going to discuss in this in with your risk risk don't stay the same throughout the project. Do you believe yeah. that the risks that were at the beginning when you did project planning are the exact same risk? Nothing new has happened that has been impacting the project now or has the risk, some of the risk changed, changed from then till now? I agree. I agree that some of the things that I, that I thought would have been an issue is not really an issue. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. In terms of, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, Camille, do you think time is still a big issue as it was before um, now, now that you got the one month extension? <laughs> well, you mean based on that? <laughs> yeah, so, so it, was, it was an issue before. It's a very valid issue for all projects. But yeah. now, no, to, no. last week, they gave an extension. So now time has now changed. So the fact is, is that we've recognized now, and you have a valid issue, that the risks change as the project and continues, right? So as, as the project progresses. And with the COVID-19, it brought about new risks, but it also mitigated against some. So risk, for example, like, and you should mention those in your reporter, right? Without focusing, you're going to mention COVID without focusing on COVID. But the reality is that time was a huge risk. And now that, now that this is the case here, um, you've got an extension and that helped to mitigate against the risk. So now that the impact of time is now much lower than it was initially or a few weeks ago. Agreed? Agreed. All right, okay. Comes, you have any recommendation for a risk that you believe that is impacting you for your project? Um, at this stage, um, technology, because if every, everywhere is slowing down, and then after your research, hopefully your internet continues to work. Right, gotcha. <laughs> so internet access now, because of what is happening, you're a bit more concerned whether this will, will function. So it has increased in your risk. And that's because the, the, without internet, it impacts greatly your research, right? Yes. All right. Trav, any particular risk you saw happening that over the past that you, reckon, you believe is impacting your project? Or what do you think is your greatest risk to your project since you started it? Um, I, I had one risk, and I, the same thing happened. Um, my laptop fell. <laughs> and... Yeah, and I'm like, sorry, I'm laughing now because it fell. I'm laughing. <laughs> sorry, that's fine. It's it working now. My laptop fell and it went blank. And another thing was my Eclipse. It went um um the what do you call that? My the drive my Eclipse was on. It deleted everything, so it formatted. So I lost the actual Eclipse connection. Um, I, 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 that, that, that actually happened to me too, eh? because I, I, I had it on one of my risks in terms of software failure and equipment failure, and my, my, Mac, my Mac did crash, but I ended up saving 
yeah. I was able to get the majority of the stuff for one time. Yes, them yeah. thing. So, so has, has that it. experience taught you to do any mitigating factors now? Should it happen yes. again? What have you done differently? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what have you done? Um, I used um, OneDrive. Right. To back up my entire folder every time I finish. So if in case anything, I would get it back on the cloud. Wonderful. Guys, I want to share with you, like, not just in the UH program, but in other programs we have, we've had students who on the day of submission indicated they've lost their full assignment. And the reality is that you want to help students, but you know, sometimes we will tell them all the different things we could try. But the fact is, is that, you know, there's only so much we can do. But what it calls for, again, is to encourage students, and especially as students who are doing an IT degree, you shouldn't just be, um, in terms of technology, you should be practicing and preaching, tech, not just preaching, but practicing the technology as well. That is out there because we all are the ones who should be extolling those values to other persons as well. So my recommendation to you all as well is back up, back up, back up. Not just your project data, project, when I say the software work only, right? True version control, but even all your files, right? Everything should be backed up on the cloud. Once you have like a Gmail account, one of those, it comes with a level of cloud storage as well, right? So I strongly recommend that you consider, consider those as options, right? All right. So based on that, you've, you've recognized that some of these risks did happen, but because you had mitigating factors available, it would have minimized the risk in some instances. Travis, in your case here, you were just happy that some of it, you know, you were able to get back your laptop because had it failed, you may have lost a lot more, right? Mm -hmm. Now you see the need maybe to have maybe alternative resources available should, should failure occur as well. Good? All right. Um, Nalini, any particular risk you had faced in this project since you started or that you've seen happening? that impacted your project? Um, no, not as yet, because I've been following um, the uh, to using the cloud, uh, using the version control as well. So for now, mm -hmm. no, nothing as yet. Your best practice student. That's excellent. No, honestly, I'm really happy to hear those stories as well. So that's great. All right. So we have an idea. So what we're looking for before I get into the chapter, the whole thing is just simply to have a discussion so that you know what we're going to discuss. So you know that we're going to talk about risk and how to, how to avoid risk. More importantly, this discussion as well is to really bring into four to the four risks that would have impacted students so that you know that when you're writing this chapter, you're not just writing it because they need a chapter called risk, but you recognize how, how you, this project is impacted as well and risk is crucial as well and finding ways to mitigate against risk is important for you to complete this project on time so now that we understand those you know let's get into to this risk by the way before I did it I didn't ask everyone but does anyone else may want to share any particular situation that really impacted them loss of data or anything like that and, and maybe what they had to do to, to overcome it all right, no problem. So let's. Ravi, not, not um, loss of data really, but um, I had applied for ethics approval for testing, and ethics approval was granted. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the, the whole situation now with COVID nineteen, um, the testing period would have been a couple of like about two weeks before submission date, right? right? And that is now that is basically well coming up soon. So. That chapter, I'll have to revisit everything about it. So that's kind of, kind of risk really to, to say on time, right. that particular chapter. Uh, uh, with the test itself. Gotcha. So therefore, so basically what you could do, you could request an extension to the ethics approval. I know that the university, <laughs> don't have their well they close and they're working from home but you can request an extension to ethics approval but definitely that poses a risk as well to to how you plan to do your testing now in your case where you're not able to get you have the ethics approval but the application has not reached the stage of readiness for testing right can anyone make recommendation on what alternatives she may have to do if she if if that's the case so she got ethics approval to do to have other people test the application but the challenge is that with COVID issues as well as with uh, other 
um, maybe not completing the, the application in time to be tested, what are the alternatives or mitigating things you can do to minimize the risk? Anyone? Oh. You have to test the application herself. Exactly. She just have to test it herself, right? So, yeah. so good. Oh, you put it on, um, you know, on a, on a live <laughs> environment. <laughs> a live environment that somebody can use to test it right now. Right, like, so have it hosted and then they can test it. Yeah, yeah. No problem. So, those are for, for does, um, Those who have ethics approval and they're using other members, do they, do they need personals? Um, yeah, because the, you see the personals are really the people who are going to use the application, not necessarily test it, right? It will be nice to have the personas test them, like persons belong to the various personas, but you should still have the personas because remember, the design and testing phase are two different functions, right? The personas are really the people who are going to use your application and it's important to know those people because one of the function of designing is to design with the user in mind. The personas help us to understand who our users are, the people who are going to use the application. So you need to have them. Testing comes later on to verify the function the functions work. So whether you are having others test it, whether you're testing it yourself, right, is separate. The purpose of testing is simply to verify does the function work, right? So they serve two separate purposes, so you should have it. Okay. All right. Okay. So moving on now with our risk section. So I'm just going to minimize this part here. So in terms of risk, these are some of the different things we're going to include in our risk chapter. So first, we're going to do, well, look at risk assessment. So this section would include any possible risk to the project, right? We look at, we'll assess the potential consequences in relation to the project, and we'll also put plans in place to minimize any negative impact of those risks, right? So in doing this chapter, it consists of five sections, the introduction, the risk, ident risk identification, where we identify the various risks, then section 4.3, we do an analysis of the risk. An analysis of the risk is simply to determine how these risks will impact the project. And based on the level of impact now, we could, we could prioritize those risks, right? And then after, we look at handling strategies to handle and min mitigate against those risks or minimize them. And then the last part is really looking back at, in terms of the risk to recognize that risks are not static. They're not going to remain fixed throughout the project. They may change over time. And therefore, it's important that you review your risk, your risk assessment structure from time to time. Don't just do it once and that's the end of it. You may have to relook it because risk may change. And you may want to recommend as well, when you're writing this chapter, which risk may have changed initially when you did it from project planning to to project to the actual project now because the fact is they would have changed over time so it's a worthwhile to mention some of those so what do you include in the introduction section and every introduction section i generally recommend the same two things one include a statement about the importance of this section so what you're going to talk about is the importance of managing risk in your project so that should be when you write your introduction it should answer the question why is risk management important and then mention the approach you're going to take in writing this chapter. The approach is simply these different points you have here. Good? So let's use an example here. A risk is an event that may prevent the project from meeting its objective within, sorry, within the time scales provided. Effective risk management strategies allow one to identify the project's strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. By planning for these unexpected events, one can be ready to respond if they arise. Successful project managers recognize that risk management is important because achieving a project goal depends on planning, preparation results, and evaluation that contribute to achieving strategic goal. This chapter focuses on the risk management process that was used to identify, to analyze, to handle, and control risk within the project. So the last sentence basically answers what is covered in the chapter. The previous um, sentences, the other sentences basically indicate the importance of risk management to the project. And we started by identifying first what our risk was. So we say what our risk is and then discuss the importance of risk management. Good. Next. So in terms of the risk, the, the method we'll be using to, to formulate this chapter is 
following closely from what Dawson has recommended. Now, if you've looked at Dawson, there's a chapter on risk. And in terms of Dawson's approach, he looks at identifying the risk, analyzing the risk, handling the risk, as well as controlling the risk. And following from Dawson, we are basically using the same structure that he has done. So the first step is identifying the risk. And what I've done for you guys, I've identified as many risks, well, quite a few risks. This is not all risk. You may have come up with other risks as well. So some of these risks may be software being unavailable, right, when needed, or hardware being unavailable because, for example, Travis, your laptop may have fallen, right, and damaged, etc. Some of you, the software you had, had a limited, um, license period which has expired right hardware underestimate sorry size underestimate or size size overestimate which i think barry would have mentioned right the technology there's a steep learning curve and this particularly in terms of for, for some of you with the programming some of you the programming wasn't very difficult and therefore it didn't provide a steep learning curve right but for others the programming has been your biggest the biggest thorn on your side in completing this project so the learning curve is far greater than you may have expected and that impeded your progress in the in the project and there are external factors and changes to your personal circumstances employment illness COVID-19 etc right general poor performance as well as scope creep and these are some and you of course could come up with others as well now so in this section or when you're writing you're going to identify start by identifying the risk right so you so in this subsection you'll indicate the risk that you've identified good and this is an example of the same thing the possible risks associated with the implementation of the proposed project identified as follows right and then you list them next is the next step now is to do an analysis of these risks and the analysis really is to, to look at how these risks could impact the project from successfully completing in order to do your your impact analysis the method you're following is described by Dawson, which is one, you, you, you work out the likelihood of the risk, you look at the consequence of the risk, if it did happen, as well as, and then you calculate the impact using a mathematical formula, impact equal likelihood by consequence. Now, in order to do this mathematical calculation, it meant that you had to allocate mathematical scores to the likelihood and the consequence. To do so, we followed again the Dawson text, which give, we give a rating. So for the likelihood, they use a rating of one to three. For the consequence, they use a rating of one to five. And overall, the risk impact had scores from one to 15, right? So you're following, you, will, you need to describe the approach taken as described by Dawson. So don't just put up your risk matrix and does it. You need to indicate to them how you went about. You need to indicate the formula, where you got it from. You need to indicate that the mathematical scores basically is an idea of, you know, one, one risk in relation to the other to help you to prioritize, right? So those are the things that you would be discussing there. Can right? we excuse? Yep. Um, we did this already in the project plan. Can we reuse and just enhance what we already did based on this? Definitely. And I would mention that at the start as well. You can reuse the entire thing. And what you do as well, I would recommend also take a look at the feedback you got. Like if you got a score of 7 out of 10, find ways to improve and enhance it. Now, 7 out of 10 is a really good score from university standard. But if you can find ways to improve and enhance it, by all means, go ahead and do so. But the good thing, you have a starting point. This chapter is, is probably 80% complete if you use simply reuse what you have or 90%. And all you're doing now is simply now embellishing it, improving, enhancing it, right? And what you will do in enhancing it, this is where you'll talk about risks that may have changed from the initial time to now or new things you have to do to mitigate, etc. right? So it's not going to be a lot of changes from before, but definitely if you had a low score like five or six, then major, five, sorry, you need to do major changes to it, right? Or less than five. Maybe, excuse me. Sure. Um, in terms of the breakout of your score, how do you see that? If you go back on your grades page, you'll see it on the project, or will you know? Right, so if you go back to project planning module, when they give you a score, they may have given you a breakdown, right? So some of some students, like last semester, I believe those students, well, previous time we did it, the students would have gotten a breakdown of their scores and for each, each one. Camille, when you did it, I'm not sure if that was given, but it should be in StudyNet. When you, when you submit your assignment and you can view your marks, it, it may have it there, right? That's right, thanks. So that's, that's uh, probably the first place to, to go and check. Okay, All right, thanks. cool. So 
in terms of the analysis now, so basically we said we allocate numerical scores and that will help, and the reason for it is purely to help us to calculate the, the, the impact and based on that score, it will help us to prioritize the impact ones, right? The impact each risk has, all right? Okay, so just a note here, this number is a dimensionless number and it's only used really to provide a relative measure of the risk so it can help you to prioritize. Good. This is an example of how you could actually state it, right? The likelihood of a risk happening and the consequence of it happening is in identifying the level of its negative impact on the project. The likelihood of each risk occurring was measured on a scale one to three, with one being a risk that is unlikely and three being a risk that's highly likely to occur. Should a risk occur, the consequence are measured on a scale one to five, with one being very low and of very low consequence and five being very high consequence. Dawson recommends using the, the following formula to calculate the impact of the risk. Risk impact equal likelihood by consequence. The scales used for these three categories are seen in tables D, E, and F below. And again, I cited it, adapted from Turner and cited in Dawson 2009. All right, next we get into the handling strategies. And the three main handling strategies are risk avoidance, which is to avoid the risk from occurring, which is what we call a preventative measure, right? So prevent it from happening. Risk minimization is really to reduce the impact of the risk when it occurs. And contingency plans are simply steps that should be taken should the risk become a reality. Now for each one of your risks, so there are examples of avoidance, minimization, and contingency planning here. I've done quite a few as well for you guys, right? Okay, but what you need to do for each one of your risks, you need to come up with with a handling strategy. Now, do you only need one handling strategy per risk? And the answer is no. One risk could have multiple handling strategy. So you could have avoidance strategy to prevent it from happening, as well as you could have a minimization or contingency plan strategy should in case it occur, right? So in this section, I'll call risk handling strategy, right? You discuss the three main strategies. So this example, there are three main strategies that can be used for minimizing risk. One is avoidance to eliminate the likelihood of it happening, minimization, reduce the impact of it when it occurs, and contingency planning, which is the steps taken when the risk occurs. And the table below shows your risk matrix, which shows the analysis and handling strategies involved. Of course, and then you have your table. And for your table, for each risk, you have your likelihood, your, your consequence, and your impact and you have your strategy at the side. Now, this person has one strategy, but as I indicated, you could use multiple strategies. This is another example of a student who used multiple strategies for each risk. Notice as well, what, what I like about this table is that for each risk identified, what this student, I, I'll say she, because I know where I got it from, right? So she, she would have done this here. She created a column called the description of the impact of the risk. So it tells you how it would impact the project which was missing from this example. So this example basically does what I say to do. This example goes beyond kind of thing. And in this example, so for each risk, they look at the impact of the risk. And for each one, the likelihood, the consequence, and, and impact, she does a descriptive score. So apart from two, she'll put medium or very high and high, et cetera, in each case, right? As well as so that if you're watching, you don't have to keep referring to the tables you would be able to get an idea, okay, this is high or this is low, et cetera. So from the table, just watching, not just the number, but the rating will be the, word, the wording underneath, which tells you whether or not, you know, this is high or low. One, one thing I'll recommend for the table, however, is that she, what I, what I would recommend is sorted by impact. So based on impact, the highest impact scores are first and the lowest impact scores are below, right? Now, the other thing that you guys have is you have your initial one, and then you have, if, if you look now, some of these may have changed. And therefore, you could mention, you. so what you do, you could update the table to the current one, and in your appendix, you put the old, right? The old original one, and you have your current one here. And in the last section, which is controlling risk, you should make mention of the risks that have changed during the, the, the project, right? So from your project proposal till now, if any risk have changed, why they have changed, right? In terms of their impact, good? And that, that basically will bring it to life. And that's what controlling risk is about. Controlling risk simply is the conclusion to the risk and helping you recognize that risk are not going to remain static throughout the project. Some risk might, 
but others may, may, may elevate or maybe they get a lower priority through the project, right? And therefore, you need to occasionally review your risk to, to determine the changing nature of it. Good? So what they suggest is you, you develop checkpoints throughout the project progress where you revisit your critical risk list and adjust it based on your latest understanding. And you need to mention this in your project. And in so doing, you should mention which risks have changed, right? And mention why they have changed as well. And that will bring this section to life because too often we just talk theory and we don't talk about real things that have happened. To, and this is where you talk about real issues that may have um, come up that would have changed the, the risk in terms of controlling the risk, all right? So this is an example of a complete risk write-up. So this section here, at the end, I give a, a full risk write-up. This is another one here. And this student here, um, Travis, I think this is yours, is it, from your... Guys, if, if this is Travis owned, then you all should not be using it because Travis could be penalized for, um, you, you all and Travis could be penalized for something. Um, Ideally, I'm required to wait until the student finishes the project to include it. Is this one yours, Travis? Yeah, I think so. I think it so. So guys, well. all right, Travis got a really high mark in this section as well. And therefore, I would encourage you, if this is Travis owned, try not to plagiarize too much from him as well but what he did as well he even highlighted the very high ones which to make it more pronounced and you could what another student did in this current batch she actually colored used colors because you know certain colors have like the red will be the very high ones and the amber will be the medium and the right and the green will be the low ones so she used like a color scheme like those as well for the risk impact to 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 help to recognize it visually as well so good all right so this is your risk section here. Any particular questions you guys have regarding the risk? All right, okay. Now, Camille, when you guys did your project proposal, you all would have had, your, you all would have had to identify your risk as well, right? And how yeah, we did risk. In the same, yeah, in a similar table and so on. I think we did that, yes. Not sure. Nalini, same for you as well, right? Yeah. No problem. So our next section now is the required uh, analysis. Uh, sorry, go right ahead, please. Yeah. Um, are about how much risk is necessary, or where's the minimum that should be there? All right. Now, Ghani said no, no more than titty. So if he said no more than titty, I would not. I would suggest you have probably at least seven, minimum seven to ten, minimum. Okay. Right. From All right. Our, good. Now. The ones I got, I'd got some of from StudyNet and what you could do, look at other textbooks and stuff like that to help to identify some of the other risks as well. And some of those sample projects as well, what the student did, they broke up risk into more than one as well, right? Now, this section, this chapter will be our last chapter for tonight because this is, a, this is one of your bigger chapters. It's called requirements analysis. Having done your IPR, a lot of your requirements were already listed in your IPR. In fact, you would have had your requirements listed from very early from your project planning module. You would have identified your requirements. But the good thing is requirements may have evolved over time because the more you get to know the project and the more you understand it, the more the requirements may have changed and enhanced as well. So I've incorporated some new ones as well for you that may be helpful. And um, now when you were doing the IPR, I did, I did send you all chapters, some sample chapters of the requirements chapter from students. So even if you follow those chapters as well, they would also be very helpful. My recommendation is always look at the chapter, look at the chapters and try to get the best out of them and then incorporate. Each of those student projects, although the students scored high marks, there are deficiencies in the chapters. The often students may have errors in referencing, etc. But overall the right the project has the, the write-up is good overall but there are errors. So be careful as well. You know that when you're taking, you take, but you, you be careful that you follow the proper standards as well. So you could use ideas, but not plagiarize. Good? All right. So our word for today as we start the requirements analysis section is, if you're helping someone and expecting something in return, you're doing business, not kindness. So I know for many of us, when we do something, we always look for a favor in return, right? That's not really kindness. That's really business, right? All right, so 
In terms of where we are now, so we are at the halfway point. We are on to chapter five of 10, which is the requirements section. So the good news is, is that this chapter is not limited to only the list of functional requirements, but we're gonna include some other stuff in here that you may not have done before. And that's what makes the requirements a bit more detailed. So it's not simply about just using the requirements you have, but now we're going a bit further than that, right? So in terms of this chapter, what is the requirements analysis? And the aim of this chapter really is to report on a set of requirements that was set that, that were the basis of your project work. Of course, you're strongly encouraged to draw on references from the literature here. And this is why we encourage you to have this after the literature review, because the literature review would have impacted your requirements. Because when you did your literature, literature review, you would have viewed websites and other sim similar websites on learning management system that would impact your understanding of this of the project to give you better ideas of what you can incorporate in yours. So the structure for this chapter would include the following. We have eight sections listed here, but again, you're not limited to these. And I'll always encourage you as well, read up a couple um, like books, like don't spend too much time because my, the aim of my writing is really to help to minimize your need and dependency on all of those books. You still have to research, but you spend more time now researching like websites and stuff to get sample projects itself and what you can include. So, so you don't have to try to figure out, you know, what are the things I should include in the project? That's my work. Now, and, and I'll give you examples. The question is, you have to figure out how to actually do a use case for yours or how to write, how to, um, or to, to get the full list of functional requirements for yours. I would have given you quite a lot to start with anyway, right? So in terms of this, this section, this, this chapter, this is what we'll include. Like all of them, there's an introduction. We will discuss briefly the process of how you went about producing the requirements. We will incorporate personas with Travis had asked about early on, and we look at different personas and how they and why they're important to your project then we'll get into the functional requirements and the non-functional requirements after you've got near requirements one way of describing them is using use cases now you may say well i don't know what use cases is and i'm not going to use it and i'm saying don't be so arrogant you know learn this project is about learning there are things that even when i had to, to teach this module I had to also learn about stuff that I was not familiar with before because I'm trying to follow best practices of different books, what some of the supervisors in the past recommended to students, what Ghani may have recommended as well, and I've incorporated them here. So the whole idea is to give you best practice based on what, recommend, what was recommended before. After use case, we'll have the information architecture. Simply put, the information architecture is like a site map because you are going to develop a website and a, a website, the site map really is at a high level helping you to navigate where the different functions are and how you will access them, right? Because you need to know where, where to access certain things. Whenever you're using a new application, sometimes you're not, you, you may not be familiar with where a particular function is. So the site map basically helps to navigate you to where, where you'll find the function, right? And Last, we'll have activity diagrams, right? So those are some of the things we would include here. So with your introduction, like all the others, you have the same things again. One, you discuss the importance of the requirements analysis to the project. Why are the requirements so important? Then you'll stay the aim of, of this chapter and what is covered in this chapter, right? So those are the, the things we're going to look at in terms of introduction. An example intro, introduction to the requirements would be, right? Chakraborty et al. describe requirements analysis as the most important phase of the system's development life cycle, as it is used to devise a clear set of a clear and unambiguous requirements, which will be used in the succeeding stages of the project and will be the basis upon which a system will be developed. This chapter outlines the approaches used in gathering the requirements. So now I'm talking about what is covered in chapter. It will discuss the approaches used to gather the requirements, it will produce a list of functional, non-functional requirements, along with a series of documents that capture the requirements, such as use case activity diagram. Notice what I simply did. My last part, my last um, sentence simply is a summary of these points here. So I simply take these, these different points that is covered in the chapter and summarize them in the last sentence. Good? And that is pretty much what is covered in the chapter. Good? Or if you look online and you search, you'll find many different persons quoting the importance of requirements analysis. Now, please know the following. 
your testing chapter is strongly linked to the requirements because when you're going to test your application, you are using these requirements in order to test the chapter to do your testing chapter. So, the, so later on, as we go through the chapter, you will see we are numbering each requirement as well, so that when you're testing, you're calling each requirement using the number, giving each other like a unique number. All right, so how did you go about producing your requirements? Let me hear from you guys. You guys already have your requirements. Where did you get your requirements from? Would you mind sharing a bit? Guys? Um, Okay, some, those who may not have spoken before as well, well, I think the class has dwindled down a bit as well for mounting, right? Tell, tell us how you guys, Jason, how did you get your requirements? Okay, so I basically went on different websites, mm -hmm. um, namely Udemy. Right. And I looked at what I thought were appealing on the website and what functionality was useful now gotcha. and I kind of made a small list and I kind of expand based on what on my on my ideas very good and I think most students would have generally done that and I think is that's the best starting point go to websites that are already there and you will find uh, the bulk of your different um, features as well now what was the role then of the literature review did the literature review helped in any way at all with your requirements right can you did any one of you got any new requirements from following the literature or no or basically come to a better understanding how to apply it to your project yes yeah anyone want to share like a testimony or example of how they how how the literature re review may have impacted their their requirements or or how they were going to do something yeah um for me when i started my well the literature review, review i had it had some references in it that I couldn't find today. That Well, if I didn't have it, I wasn't finding them today. The same things that I got in the literature review back then, I wasn't getting them. So I went back to the list of the functional requirements that I had, the whole list. And when I checked them out, when I well, did the research and put in the same resources, I, I was able to find them. And some of these things were actually helpful. Very good. What I, what I think the literature review also helps as well, you know, like we may see a requirement and what we do is we call it by a name we are, we are familiar with, right? And the name may not be the proper jargon. And what I find the literature review does, it helps us now to come up with proper term, the terminology for it, right? So for example, like things like add a course, edit a course, add content, etc., right? The proper term for those are like course authoring. So when you do more research, they give you better terms to use for the same set of yeah. features as well. And those things really help us now in terms of making, um, you know, improving the quality of our writer. Because the real, the truth is, pretty much a lot of students have the exact same headings that in their report. So if you look at one CTS student report to another, the headings are generally the same, yet the marks are not always the same, right? And that's because the quality of writing, the use of proper terms and jargon and writing style, all of those things really could help to shape the, the, the reader's perception of the quality of your project and could change your marks as well. So the same thing with your literature review, it helps to really give you some additional information. Like there's one that I included called SCORM compliance, right? Now, I, I'm normally, when I'm looking through, I don't really see SCORM compliance anywhere, but I found it actually on reading a, a, a online about functions to include in, um, in a learning management system and I found SCORM compliance. And then strange enough on Canvas, I saw they had a section marked SCORM as well in, in it. Uh, if I'd seen that, I'd never know what it meant, but because I, I found out about SCORM compliance, I learned more about it and understand now even Canvas uses SCORM compliance, right? So some of those we'll discuss as we go through. So literature review really can help to in, impact and enhance, you know, the functional requirements also. So what we're going to look at now is in terms of the different ways, the different things that may have influenced the gathering requirements. So for this section, it's not going to be very long, but you discuss the different things that would have impacted your requirements. Some of these would have included studying documentation 
including now in most modules your assignment briefing she tells you all you need to know about your assignment but definitely not this one so the assignment briefing sheet may not have helped much but uh, studying maybe module units may have helped right researching similar applications definitely was one of the biggest help for many of you right um, now of course you may not be able to use asynchronous interviews but the fact is is that some of you based on your feedback from your supervisor may have been advised about some requirements because i did see in some of mina's responses to students sometimes she blind copied me on them and in some of her comments she would have mentioned as well about you know give you some feedback on requirements and some of those recommendations could help to encourage you know to add other requirements as well so so you have some from your supervisor advice from your supervisor right background research would have helped as well as well as even when you were developing the personas, right? It would have helped you to, to enhance your list of requirements also. So in writing this section, you simply discuss the different things that would have impacted you coming up with your requirements, right? So, and of course, we do have an example of how you can write this, right? Which is the next slide. So several approaches were used to gather the requirements for the, well, I have children's clothing store in this case. This include viewing similar websites such as Amazon and et cetera. Right, so you name the different ones. A comparison of the websites and the features they employed form the basis of the core and advanced requirements. Requirements such as, and you list them, are common to most e-commerce site or learning management system. Additionally, the background research played an integral role in influencing the requirements. Features such as responsive design, recommender system, gamification, etc., were incorporated based on the background research conducted. So here I'm showing, so notice I'm not just saying uh, what up now what what I want you to get from the writer I'm not just saying where what influence but I'm showing how it influences as well so instead of just saying Amazon wherever influence I'm telling you what aspects of Amazon influence my writer so if I said I went to Udemy or Coursera or wherever tell me some of the things from there you don't have to list all that influence it if your background research influence it, tell me somehow or some of the ways the background research influence. So, so it's not just stating that it did, but showing and, and justifying that it really did by giving examples. Okay, so that is what is required from you when you are writing this section. Okay, next, personas. Now, personas are really crucial because you can develop a website, but it really doesn't cater to your user need. It's important that when you're developing a website that you develop for the user in order for it to be successful. And that's where personas comes in. If any one of you had done UXD, a user, sorry, user design experience, you would have covered personas. And I'm not saying you're at a disadvantage if you haven't, but because those persons may already know what personas is, right? So they know what I'm talking about. But for those who haven't, what personas are, they are basically about describing the nature of the people who are going to use the system because you want to describe with the users in mind. You need to know all the different things about those users, what makes them happy, what really irritates them as well, sort of thing, so that it would, you would look at how you can incorporate this into your design of the system. What devices do they use, etc. What frame of mind are they in when they are looking? What are the things that they look for as well, sort of thing. And, and based on that, it could influence the features that you have. Now, how do you, how do you design or, or put your personas? There are many different ways to include it. Now, ideally, this table here, this slide here, tells you some of the information you need to include about your personas, such as name, age, job title, family address, just, just random details. Of course, these are all fictitious information you're putting in, but they represent, uh, they may represent actual person, but they're fictitious information, though, right? Personality of the person, are they introvert, extrovert, analytical or creative, conservative or liberal? What are their goals? What is your persona looking for in a product? Do they want something that is easy to use, a device or service that achieves a specific goal? And these answers are critical because it helps in developing your product, right? Most personas goals should be end goals, right? So in terms of the other things as well, if you want to include a code to capture their personality as well, what they're interested in, et cetera, what frustrates them, right? What is preventing your persona from using or achieving his or her goals? What concerns does she have? What are her frustrations with current situations already or solutions currently available? 
right? Because by understanding their frustrations about similar systems, they will be able to design those things to reduce those frustration level. And of course, you can include a small bio as well because you want your persona to come to life. Now, so this is simply the information you incorporate, some of them. How do you design it? And there are different software tools you could use to design your personas, right? These are examples I've pulled from online. So notice that have some of the things, motivation, brands, preferred channel, bio, frustration, goals, and it includes some traits at the top on the left. I put a picture for them. Please note, you should be careful about using pictures from the net unless they are free pictures that, you know, those that are, that are free, free to use, right? All right, and you put some information on their age, job, etc., and personality. So this is a template you could use, right? Where could you get templates? Extensio has a lot of templates you could use. It may have their watermark, but that's okay. The university doesn't care about that because remember, one of your alternative is using software that's free, and therefore one of the side effects maybe they may include their watermark on it, but that's not a big issue at all, right? Okay, and even this blog, the artificial artificial however it has different personas as well so you can find a lot of personas if you search properly online you can get already developed personas that you can tailor as well for your need these are some examples so let's let's take a look and let's see if we could um adjust now a lot of these were more for um, e-commerce systems right so here we have mary jones right so Mary Jones goal is to make learning fun. Well, this one actually is learning to make learning fun and interactive, right? So she wants fun and interactive learning just based on that goal. Does that influence any feature you may have? Just take a look at the first goal. Can, can you suggest what, what it may suggest to you that you may want to incorporate into your system, right? To make this learning fun and interactive. This hmm? was a design. Right. I would probably use the gamification. Now, where, where responsive design may come in is if you look at what devices she used to, um, to, 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 um, to go online, right? Okay, so somewhere you could probably look at the device she uses as well, right, for, for going online. In her case, she uses more traditional TV, online, and social media. It doesn't tell us the device she used, but if she used like smaller devices, responsive design may be better for her, but learning fun and interactive might be more um, gamification stuff that you may have, right? Okay, start kids on the journey of education to make an impact on student lives, to make sure my family is happy and healthy. Now she could be a, she's from reading that she's likely a teacher. So now you're discussing from her side as well, right? From the teacher side. So if you look a bit about Mary and her bio, to the, well, not her bio, but to the left, under her picture, it has age 44, primary school teacher, married with two children, lives in Melbourne, right? Um, she's a bit more of an introvert, a bit more creative, a bit cautious, more cautious than I'm thinking, and a bit more active than passive. Her frustration is things taking longer than they need to be due to other circumstances, traffic and pressure to get to places on time. So online learning will be good for her as well. Taking things taking longer than they need to. So therefore, maybe she'd be able to fast track her learning as well. Slow internet in class and at home, complicated activities that students struggle with, right? So therefore, you may have to figure out ways to help to, to make activities easier and fun, right, for her. Good. So this is an example of Mary. And you have others. Sophia is a student. So notice I did, when you're doing, consider one from a teacher perspective and at least one from a student perspective, right? Okay, so Sophia is a 19-year-old student, likes to hang out with friends after class, receives pocket money from parents and has a part-time job, looks out for student deals, has, no, has time but no money. So she has time but no money. So basically she can take her time in terms of studying. So the, now the reality is that not all of these are written for our particular um, learning in mind, right? But the fact is, is that what you should try to do as well when you're writing it, write about things that could influence and impact the design of your system. So the things that you include there are telling you about the person's two things. So for example, right, let us talk about building a persona. So with these in mind, let's build a persona. Now I, I'm trying to get a persona who we, we want to, to promote self-paced learning, right? We want to, to um to do like, for example, taking quiz and stuff like that, right? But learn at their own pace with quiz and, and who has different learning style, 
right? So based on that now, and you're creating a persona, let's talk about in terms of like a bit about the personality because self-paced learning is a feature you would incorporate into your project, right? What do you think might be a feature of the student that would facilitate or foster self-paced learning? Can you guys suggest things about the person that could facilitate that may suggest self-paced learning? The assessment um, or um, some gamification could do it with level, um, what do you call that? All right. Um, well, we, we, just a little bit of of um, thing there, Trav. What I'm looking for is uh, like a frustration of the student that would that would lead you to want to implement self-paced learning. So, for example, the student could be a very smart student who often finds that she's handicapped in a class and she has to go at the pace of the class, so like that kind of thing. Or on the opposite end, could someone suggest on the opposite end? So the student is not very fast, but find themselves the opposite of fast. So, so a fast student oh, might want to study yeah. at their own pace, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the a slow student. A yeah, slow student. Slow. Very good. A slow yeah, student yeah. Who, who often feels lost in the class because the teacher assumes everyone understand because a few understand everyone understands so that's an example of a frustration now what i'm trying to show you is how these frustration how to write how to write these things so that it link indirectly or directly to your features right remember if you just put a set of stuff there and it's not linked to your feature and not very clear then it's not very helpful when you are writing your personas the things you write about should be linked somewhere to, to the features that you're going to include. So, so for example, one of the features you have is self-paced learning, let's say, right? Then the self-paced learning is not for your average student because the, the classes are catered for average. If a student is very smart, they may feel kept back by the class. Similarly, if a student is very slow, they may also feel frustrated, but they're frustrated because they don't understand and the, the pace of the class is a bit too fast for them. So based on that, those things will be their frustrations, right? Yeah, and those, um, get, go ahead. Um, uh, so a face junk could also apply to like an adult learner who is weak and, and time is um, critical. Very much. So, so these are different things you are going to throw in into there. An excellent example there, right? A, a person who is basically, they're very busy. They don't have time for the, their time because they work shift, etc. Their, their, their timing is really quite off and therefore fitting into the traditional classroom model is really a challenge because they tend to miss most of their classes, right? Excellent. So, we have some of those that you've come up with now. Let's use, let's tell me about things that could influence gamification. Other than what the person said, they want fun and interactive learning, right? Um, um. We'll work with fun and interactive learning. <laughs> The student hate being bored. <laughs> Oh, no, but what boredom might be more in terms of like um, boredom might be gamification oh. could help. So you have that of it. But the other thing with boredom might be more co um, collaboration. Collaboration, oh. right? Because you bored, you can collaborate. Yeah. Um, How about the person being competitive? Very oh. good. Competitive being reward system as well. So you have ranking, rewards, etc. So a competitive person is competitive in nature and likes to be first, you know, et cetera. So yeah, therefore yeah. reward ranking and those things are, will, will come out from those. Good? Yeah. Right. yeah. But what I'm trying to guide you to is that I want you to understand the role that this plays in helping you to, to, as you list your requirements. So let's give me another requirement and, and let's work backward. Because you've already identified the bulk of requirement, right? Um, so tell tell me a requirement and let's see if we could come up with what are some of the features of the person that you could use to help. 
um, the student, no, okay, um, they want to know, well, they have struggles with um, remembering their homework. Good. So and, what feature they have, so the struggle is, the struggle that they have is trying to remembering their work? Yes, yeah. Right. So what, what, you, what feature would you have to help them in terms of remembering, recalling, etc.? Push notification, uh, emails. Um, you can use email notification. Um, what else? You could use also um, a gamification can be used. No, not really. Um, uh, when you say struggle remembering, meaning remembering the content? Yeah, remembering not to do the assignments. When the assignment is due. Oh, okay, good. So basically or, organized, that person is not very organized. So that's different. So that's an, so if the person is not very organized, they may not know when things are. So therefore, yeah, you yeah. would need to have like reminders and push notification or calendars, right? Yeah. Yeah. On, on the system advising that those are due. But if a person is not very, for example, the, the, the ability to recall is not that great. So basically, they often need, they don't remember a lot in terms of content. What feature could you in, include now for those part now? Access to multiple times, you know, but, um, they can access it at any time each session. Right. The Even for example, like formative tests, formative tests are really tests that are not for marks, but basically yeah. it's to help a person's memory. Remember, yeah. true formative testing is really just questions asking you to help you to recall. You know, so by every time you read something, it asks you, it asks you like a few questions as well based on what you've just read. And the purpose of those is really just to help you to improve your understanding and your ability to recall what you've read. So like quiz, formative testing, etc., right, would be helpful. Good. So, so you, you're seeing now for every one of your requirements, now you're not going to put all of them into one persona. Your teacher has a persona, your students have personas as well. And not, no two teachers are necessarily alike or two students are fully alike. But what I'm getting at is if you use reverse, you, you know, reverse engineering, you already have the bulk of your features. All you have to do now is look at what are the persona, what are the things about the persona that could link to this feature so that at the end they are pointing subtly to the feature. So we go back to something Nima was suggesting. Nima, you had recommended responsive design. Tell me something about the person now that you would include in their persona that would, that would indirectly link to responsive design. Nima, it looks like you have a UFO in the background there, girl. You know, it's like the person is always on the go, and 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 that's always time they have access to a laptop, they have other devices, mobile devices, and many things access to a computer. Wonderful. Or, for example, her favorite device is her phone, right? But at the same time, she also uses a tablet as well as her laptop. Right, and therefore she needs access to the information at any point and any time. Therefore, any of these devices would be required, should be using, right? Is it is that a requirement to use like a, a pretty mixed Chinese girl? Oh, can I call the yellow? <laughs> no, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, please forgive me. I simply copied okay, from okay. online, right? I plagiarized right. this in order to provide examples. I didn't develop them all on my own. And this was simply one that the, the formatting, I looked at it for the colors, the formatting, the layout, etc. And yeah, if it, yeah. right? Okay, okay. <laughs> but I know there are a lot of guys in class who may be interested. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> um, <what? laughs> so, so yeah, that, um, and, um, I realized something too. I use the, there's yes, this one. I use the, um, when you see motivation and you see the bar, the, um, right. the progression bar, I use some of those to kind of describe my characters and to answer somebody, well, to indirectly um, speak about them. Example, like social, um, I kind of put the bar high and then see that person kind of socially. Uh, what would a high social suggest for you guys? I would use a social network on my Right, so you incorporate like social life. learning, right? So they, therefore you could share yeah. on the different social media stuff as well, right? If a student 
is very much like likes interaction and stuff like that. So if interaction level is high for motivation, right? So so she loves like interacting with people as well. What would that suggest for you guys? Extrovert, extrovert. No, um, feature. What feature would feature. that have? In? Um, sharing, social collaboration. Yeah. The member, co the collaboration. Yeah. Collaboration with others. So like you know, like discussion forums, etc. Good. So you guys have a few idea what is required of you all then in this section? Yeah, make up some. Yeah, make up some individuals. Um, names. Yeah. These are made up names of people. Yeah. These are made up names, and you could use pictures of yourself, your family, if you want. Try not to use anyone under eighteen, unless yeah. you're developing a system for kids or something like that, right? But to a mom, right? So, like how I was gonna do um test well, I might still be doing testing, right? Um, these two things kind of tie tie up together, like because test, sorry, you're using testing, you say? Yeah. So, like um, the personas will be people who you're trying to create a system for, right? And ideally, the tester should be people who will be using it. Right, but your testers may not. Your te if you you may or may not be able to get testers to represent the broad list of personas, but definitely yeah. there are people who use it. But are your testers so, mainly teachers or are your testers students as well? A combination of both. Right. So, so you can use your personas to describe them. Okay. Right. So, um, so you'd use your personas to describe the various ones, but you see, um, what you're trying to do as well, when you're using your personas, you try to get as many of your functions. Now you're not writing the functions in, in the persona. I want to be clear in the, in these personas, you're not actually writing the functionality, collaboration, whatever you're writing things that suggest collaboration, right? Like, like engaging yeah. with friends and stuff like that, meeting people, that sort of thing. And having discussion, yeah. it likes to discuss the topic and content and that sort of thing, right? Yeah. Cool. Names, this picture is for you. Sorry about that, right? <laughs> 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 All right, okay. So, same, same as for the others, right? So, I have quite a few for you guys, and you have even, right? So, there are quite a few of them. Now that we've done that, let's go now to the functional requirements now. Now, for most of you, you already have your requirements. So you're going to list your requirements as core and advanced. So under the functional requirements, you will include core and advanced. And for each of these requirements, you're going to provide a detailed description and rationale for each of them, right? Now, it's difficult to include all of them in your main body. Now, what I noticed though, for some of you guys, right? What you did in your IPR, you only put the ones that you did, meaning the one you implemented, which was wrong because you're underselling your project. You're supposed to put all the requirements, not just the ones you've implemented, right? Because in the end, you're shortchanging yourself. So, so from here, these are just examples. So under each one, under each requirement, you have core or advanced and who can access it. Now, if you want as well, in this same table, now, you could either do it in this table or you could do it separately. But for each of these requirements, notice I gave them a unique name, a number, FR1, FR2, etc. So each requirement has a unique number. It's listed as core advanced and you have who could access it. So public means you don't need a password to access it. And of course, registered users would be like, you'll, you, in your case, you'll use like students or lecturer kind of thing. So your terms might be public, students, lecturers, or administrator, right? Now, for each of these requirements, you'll identify those that are core and those that are advanced. And here's an example of list. So if you haven't included these already, I will strongly suggest you include them, but don't limit yourself to these. Include more, please, right? So these are some, right? These are some more as well. So these two slides have a lot of core and advanced requirements, right? Okay. So I'll just skip these a bit. And then for each of these requirements, you need to describe them in detail. What some students may have done is include the description and rationale inside of this table here, right? So some of them included the description and rationale here. Some student treat left it as separate tables. Your choice, which one? But for, for excuse, each requirement, you need to clearly um, describe them. Now, when you are describing, I want you to understand the purpose of the description. 
when you are describing, you should describe it with so much detail that someone can actually visualize the screen. You can actually see the fields already on the page, on the page, on the web page. You can actually picture the fields on the page because of the details in your description. Because this here is going to now influence the design, right? This is also going to um, influence the tables, which fields you have in your tables, etc. Right? So it's very important that you paint a really detailed picture if you can here. So let's take an example of creating an account. Just from reading it, you should be able to describe and see the page coming alive in some regard. It may not talk about colors and layout, where exactly it is, but at least you get an idea what fields are included in the page. So to create an account, it says, in order to purchase items on the website, users must first create an account. So I'm trying to justify why I need the feature. This requires the user to enter their name, their email address, and a password, as well as a confirmed password. So just from that, you can see four fields on the form, a name, email, password, and confirmed password. It tells you further now, like validation taking place on the form. The username must be unique and the password will be tested to ensure it is a strong password. So it's telling you further that you're implementing strong passwords, right? Once the information has been validated, a record will be stored in the database. The user will also receive a message that they have been registered. So it's telling you that after the user has been validated, they will get an email advising that, they have been registered, right? So you could actually tell how this feature is going to work. You're describing it so that the person who's going to design it, in this case, it's you, you already have a fair idea what, how it's going to work. And even the person who has to build it also has a clear idea as well. The rational now is the reason for having the function. And the rational for it is registration is required in order for a user to log in, right? because they have to log in with their email address and password so that they can make purchases, view the order history, etc. In your case, they need the password to be able to log in, enroll in their course, be able to determine, track their progress through the course, etc. right? Okay, another example again, a search feature. Notice for each one, you include the requirements number. A search bar will be available on the homepage to allow users to quickly enter a keyword or part of the product name or description, right, or category or brand. A search is then made to find the matching keywords, right, to records that match the keyword. The results of these are displayed on the search page along with a message indicating how many matching items were found. Example, 1 to 10 of 30 found, allowing the user to select the particular product from the list or to search again if desired. And why do you need searching? Searching allows easy filtering of the products in the catalog, thereby reducing the time it takes for a user to find the desired product. The faster they find a product, the greater they likely will purchase. And for every one of your requirements, you do your work along with this. Now, I strongly recommend including a couple of these in the main body of the, the, your, your write-up. And the rest, the full list, you'll include in the appendix. But the write-up needs to have them. And those are, those are your functional requirements. But your functional requirements really give a description or detail, whether you have a simple solution or a complex solution. And you need complex in order to get a high mark. So I strongly recommend going back to this here that you use all of these and some from here as well if you can, or all of them if you, if you wish, right? Because you want a level of complexity with your pro project. So I've given you a lot of them. I've used, I tried as much as possible to use the correct technical terms as well, right? Okay, all right. Next is the non-functional. The non non-functional requirements usually are requirements that are not specific to a user, right? So like responsive design is really non-functional as opposed to functional, right? Because not specific to a user. So security, usability, uh, maintainability, scalability, all of these are non-functional requirements, right? So browser compatibility, the fact that it could work on various browsers and you need to list the browsers you want it to work on, right? Those are non-functional requirements. So for the different non-functional, I've, I've listed them here for you. You could just use the same list, but change the rationale for each one to your words, but use the same like application security, database security, browser compatibility, maintainability, consistency, and usability. You could use those, but change the rationale. Good? All right. Now, 
after you've listed all your requirements, the functional requirements, now the next thing you do is develop what we call use cases. Use cases basically you can drill down to various levels, but what use cases are, they really help us to understand the requirements linked to each user group and how they interact with the system, right? So ideally for use case, you'll have actors. The actors are the users of the system. Could you like tell me who are the actors in your system that you're developing? There are three main actors. I have a user, the, well, the, well, in mine, I have a user, and in the user, I have a visitor and, a actual, and the actual member. And it's a visitor. A visitor has to log in, has to use username and password to log in? No, the visitor is just the one that um, mm -hmm. watches the... So they are content. public users. So the general yeah, term yeah. for those are public users, right? Public users are yeah. users without a username and password. So that's yeah. one, right? And, well, with that, I have the member, so I put that in one. Okay. But they will be two I, separate, because a member and a registered user, a member and a public user are two separate users, because there's oh, okay. something a public user can, cannot do, do that uh, yeah. a registered user. When I user say I put them in one, as you say free, I, I just kind of break it down. Okay. But no, we'll list like, all of them. You can list all that you have. Okay. So you have public user, oh. yeah, a member. User, member, teacher, and admin. Wonderful. Any, what about the rest of you guys? What do you call your users? Anyone else want to share? Learners and tutors. Wonderful. So learners are another word for students and the tutors. Very good. And you may have like, a, are there aspects of this that a public user would be able to do or view, etc., right, that they don't need a username password to do? Is there anything they can do without needing a password? I have unregistered users that can view, well, will get a better idea of the site itself because it has a, um, it has a, on the home page itself, before you log in, mm -hmm. you can see what the what courses and um, what content the site has on it. So, an unregistered user or just a visitor on the site can see what what all the information that the site um, will and have. I agree with you, Nalini, because I believe that you need to be you, you don't just go straight to Amazon and sign up. You have to build confidence in the site that there's something yeah. that you need before you sign up, right? Therefore, yeah. There, there should be freebie, even offering a free course without even a registration kind of thing. Well, maybe to entice them to get a free course, you give them, you know, like to register to get a free course or something like that. But the fact is, you need to be able to show, like, have a course that's publicly available, where if you click on it, you can drill down so people can see the kind of content that they get. So you may choose to have, like, a demo course so people can actually... Um, click on it, view the content, etc., for it so that they know the kind of quality that they're getting and build trust before they sign up for other courses, kind of thing, right? So, yeah. so, so your public interface may have some of those features there. So, therefore, in that regard, because you don't need a username and a password to do that, you should have a public user or an unregistered user, whatever term you choose to use. Now, in some websites, the teacher and the administrator are one and the same. In your case, Travis, you have separated them and all of those are, in, are, are correct. There are no wrong version of it. Both are fine, right? Um, the other thing now, you will see these circles. The circles represent the use case. What are your use case? The use case really are the functions you've listed in your functional requirements, right? And then the system, which is the system you're building, is represented by a, a big rectangle. So the big rectangle represents what is in the system and all your, all your use cases ideally will be part of the system, right? So an example will be here. So here you have your different users. So we're using stickmen to represent the user. So you have a patient, you have a receptionist and you have a doctor and the circles represent the different functionalities and it's telling you which ones the patient could use, which one the reception could use, which one the doctor can use. And there's going to be some measure of overlapping in, in terms of them, right? So you'll see yeah. those. Go ahead. I think I've in regard to this. Um, so how many use cases can we put into our um, project? Because I know um, when I started doing my use case, um, I read about it. And based on the research I did, that you know, too much, too many of it is not a good use case. Like too many. Um, but it may look cluttered, 
right? Yeah. So what you do, depending, if, if you can develop it where it's not cluttered, that's fine, right? Alternatively, what some persons do, they, they do a separate use case for each user. So yeah. you do one for the student, you do one for the teacher, you do one for the public user kind of thing, right? And some yeah. people, right? So, and some do aspects of the use case, right? Like this yeah, one that, here. That's how I did mine. It's a specific area, right? So what you may have is some people may have a, a broad use case, like the overall one that has everything. And then from there now, they drill down into specific areas, right? So use cases are helpful in order to recognize the different functions associated with the different users and how some of these are linked to one another, right? So for example, if you look at this diagram here, you would see that the patient could search for available appointment. And when they search, they could search by date or search by doctor, right? Also, you, you will see um, for when they manage appointments, they could either cancel the appointment or change the appointment date, right? Etc. cetera. So some, some cases are linked to other cases as well. So this is an example of use case. And use case are also helpful in describing the interaction with the different users and the different features as well, right? So these are examples of use case, all right? Okay, so this one is specific to like online shopping use case. To view items include searching the item, browsing the item, view recommended items, adding to shopping cart, etc. So all of these are, are include viewing, included in viewing, all right? So these are, are some sample ones here. After the use case, you have the information architecture. And the information architecture is like a site map. And it's important because it helps you to plan the layout of your site. So with a site map, this is an example of a site map. You have the home and you have, it shows you a different level of navigation because not everything is going to be on the home page, right? To get to some features, you have to go through other features to get to them, right? And that's why it's called a web page because you know you could go, it's not, the, in terms of structure from from the home page is where you start and you can get to the other parts of it as well right so this is an example of a home front a home page some of these are a bit blurry but the example of different ways different you know like the structure of how to access the different functions this is another one as well right and they show you how it, how they all linked in that regard Right. This is a simpler one. From home, you have medication, doctor appointment, activities category. And from medication, you can do these. From appointment, you can do these, etc. So, but you need to have an infrastructure, the site infrastructure. And the site infrastructure basically is your site map that basically helps to determine where the different functions are and how you can access them. Right? You all are familiar with what a site map is? No. Okay, so what, what a sitemap is, is basically helping you to find where to get the different functions. So for example, let's, let's talk about at a high level for StudyNet, right? If you're on StudyNet and you want to post an assignment, to upload an assignment, do you get that straight from your home page on StudyNet or do you have to drill down? Where, where could you, if you could give me an idea of from StudyNet, if, if you were to build a sitemap for StudyNet, where, where would you go to submit an assignment? First you, would, first, you would go. So, from on, home, what are some of the things you will see from home on, on, on StudyNet? My courses. My courses, right? Online, mm -hmm. um, there's the, the access to the library. Yeah, and then you see the course name or the course right. title. Good. So, no. under courses now, so under courses, if so, courses is at my courses is a tab, and under my courses, you, you have the, the list of course, right? From there, you click on. And from the course. the course now, you can then go to the, the, what are the things within a course? You have the units, you have the assignments, you have. Lessons, materials. Yes. Well, yes. units will be, I think they call it units on Canvas, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I feel yeah, sad for all of us because we should be using Canvas. Yeah, that's what it is. It's just unit. <laughs> right. unit. You have well, units, you have assignments, you have. Discussions. Discussions. Um, we have the notification, that's the email inbox. Right, etc. Right? So yeah. 
So based on those, those are basically, if you were to develop a site map, it shows you where to get different things, right? And the same thing you have to do for your site because your site is a website you're building. And therefore, you, you have many functions in your site, right? And therefore, this here is really a map to help to navigate to where to get the different functions because you won't be able to see it clear as day from the very top, right? Um, what, what software was used to build that, that site map? You could use any um, like ER diagram software, any Visio and things like those. You could use those to develop it. Um, if you search online as well, there are, there are other software you could use to develop it. Some people do it in PowerPoint, in Word, right? But I'm there are other software. It might be a bit more harder to do it like that, but you could Visio is generally a recommended tool. Um, Ravi, wanna, they say we have Visio, but we're not getting it. I'm not getting it. I don't know. You have other free software you might be able to use if you don't if you're not getting the Visio, right? Um, you're talking about from Office 365, Travis. Yeah, Which from our you? Office 365, and this is well studied. Not give it to us, but I'm not sure. I don't. No problem. I, I think Publisher too will do it. Correct. And there are other free software you could use that are lighter as well, Trav. Like any ER diagram and in fact you could just search software to develop sitemaps right and yeah you, sh yeah you should be able to get a few coming up right but okay. do you what role do you think the sitemap plays in terms of this here in terms of your project can you help me to identify why you think this is important why you need to be able to understand the layout where things go etc um you could understand the flow of how to get to something the location the path of something correct because you see when you're going to design you need to have a proper idea where things should be because the the thing is the last thing you want to do is rewrite coding because yeah and rewrite coding means the code wrong so you have to redo it because that's that is what takes up the bulk of your time right so in order to properly plan and minimize the amount of time spent in design and in, and in building if you have a good design that is well structured that's well thought out then it will minimize some of those. So therefore, you've, you've already just identified in the earlier section all the different requirements that you need. Where will those requirements be placed? You're not gonna stick all of them on your homepage, right? You need to be able to figure out where they will go, structure them, organize them, etc., so that they are placed within the different things. Good? Yeah. You all follow, right? Now, some of your requirements are, are non-functional. You don't need to put non-functional here because there's no button to click for self-paced learning, right? So self-paced learning is not a functional requirements because there's no, you know, like a click a button for self-paced kind of thing. You don't have to do, you don't do that. The, by nature, the, the, it is self-paced, you know, so you could, you could go at your own pace kind of thing, right? So, for example, a like quiz, you won't get quiz straight from the home page. You may have to drill down into a module and complete a unit to take a quiz kind of thing. So everything is located in its right place, right? And it's logically structured. And that is what the purpose of the information architecture is used to show. So that when you are working now with, with um, Marcus and building a site, you know where things, where you will be putting it because you have developed your architecture, your site, site map to determine where things will go. All right. Okay. And the last section now is in terms of activity diagram. Now, what the activity diagram is really is like a flow chart of a process. Now, for the activity diagram, what, what I'd re recommend is consider a process that is important to, 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 your, um, to your project in terms of the application, and you could map it out. This process could be the process of the flow of doing an entire course right you don't need to map every single process but you could take maybe the most crucial one right let's look at an example of this one here and then from here we can use it to develop one for yours where where a person enrolls in a course and completes a course right so before we do that this one is really for shopping uh, online shopping cart now most of you should be able should be familiar with this even though this is not the application you're building right for this process you have you have the you're starting over here so you start you, you search for an item now when you search for an item either so from here you search you go this way either the item is found or it is not found and if it's not found you go back to the search 
notice right from this decision box if it's found you go here if it's not found you go back to search for the item now if it's found you will view the item after viewing the item you could add it to the shopping cart now the, the thing is of it doesn't mean you must go to the shopping cart if you want you could add more complexity and after viewing item you could go back to searching you don't have to go to here right so you add it to, if you add it to the shopping cart now you can either now edit the shopping cart or view the shopping cart and when you finish you come here now you confirm your order after you confirm your order you do your payment you pay with either credit card or paypal these are the options available on the system you ship the order receive order that's the end so notice it's more of a high level but help you to understand the flow and the dynamics let's do one with taking a course now your systems may be slightly different right but I need you guys to guide me a bit and we're using this as an example of taking a course on your site. If you start, right, what would you have here for your system? Because I'm assuming in your system there, it's a bit kind of like Amazon where there are many courses and you have to choose a course, right? So what will this be in your system? And if I could get as much interaction and engagement from you guys here, what would you be doing? Like search, search course or right you could browse course catalog or search for a course excellent and when you search for a course either it's found or it's not found if it's not found you go back to here right good good if it's found now right then what will this be here this will be if you found the course what will you do review course or right course. review course details or view the course information right and then what will you do next? Yes, you can correct because ideally after enroll in the course. So when you yeah. after viewing it, you could then enroll in the course, right? Good. So here will be enroll in the course. Are you all do you all have those features to enroll in the course? Or everything yeah. everyone right? Okay. Good. So you enroll in the course. After you enroll in the course now, this part here will be about taking the course now. So now that you enroll in it, right? What are some of the things you will do here now? What goes next before you finish the course? You will review a unit. After you review a unit, what will you do next? You take a quiz. Take a quiz, take a lesson. Right. So now those could be in one after the other. So you review a unit, then you take a quiz, and then you go back up to review unit and take quiz, right? That could be like a loop, right? Okay. And, and then, of course, before you go back, you check to see if there are any more units, right? Is the course finished or are there more units, right? So if the course is, is finished, you will come down. But if the course is not finished, you go back to review the next unit, right? So So okay. what you have here is, Review the unit, you take whatever quiz, and then you have a question mark like, um, and that question mark could be, uh, are there more units? And if the answer is yes, then you go back to review unit, take quiz, and you come back. Are there more units? You go back again. If there are no more units, then what do you do now when the course is finished? You okay. Well, you get your reward. Well, you get your, well, it depends on what it is. Um. We're not making oh, it over complex because so it wouldn't include every single thing. But at, when the course is finished now, you, you view, probably, your score, view your results. View your results, right? Obtain your certificate or whatever, right? And then does it. You follow? Yeah. It, it's a high level flow of how the process works, right? So it it the the role of this is to help you to see the flow of how it how it should work because remember in your mind you have to go and program these things and when you're programming you have to program it with a flow in mind you need to understand what that flow is and if you don't understand that flow then you wouldn't know what you're coding what each screen should be able to do right so that's the nature of this diagram here is to help you to understand the flow so that when you finish one where do you go to next? Where do you go after each one? Do you go back? Do you go forward, etc. Right? So let's modify it a bit further. Any one of you using um, you know, where you where you, um, 
unlocking the lesson only if they complete the first lesson you cannot just jump to any lesson you have to, to pass the test in order just to move on to the next lesson yeah if you do then in this phase here where you view, you view the unit you take the test what you need to do after if you pass the test then you go up to the next unit if you fail the test you go back to retake the unit right yeah yeah. Good. So that might be just some modification you'll include there to show that you know you, you're only unlocking when they have succeeded, right? Would anyone like to ask um, of a feature so we can discuss it as well to see how we can develop it? You throw out one to me and let's see if we can discuss them. Um, what about um, if the use a re requesting a new password or something yeah a new password yeah all right now that's a simple flow for thing right so basically if the user want if the user wants to reset their password good all right so where would they go to to change their password as you think it like login i guess the login page <laughs> no well you already logged in you probably have to go to user profile Oh, okay. So change. Oh, if you log in, okay. Right. You, you, right. Ideally, okay. So let's suppose there's forget password and there's change password, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ideally, to change your password, you'll have to log in and then change your password. If you forgot your password, that's a different process, right? Yeah. Forgot. I mean, sorry. That's what I wanted to say. Forgot. Okay. Forgot password. Yeah. All right. But, so, what if somebody wants to like um, unenroll in a course halfway or midway? They want to enroll me. Okay, so your course is already start. What you in your case, you have everyone starts the course at the same time. You don't self self piece. No, 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 no. I mean, um, they enroll in the course and they start the course, but they want to unenroll. Do you register? Yeah. All right. Do you have that up? Okay. So before we get to that, let's go back to Travis one, and we'll come back to yours. So help me in terms of building the solution for Travis. So Travis wants to, he's forgotten his password and wants to reset it, right? So basically, what would he have to click if he forgot his password? Login? No, you forgot your password, you can't log in. <laughs> you forget it. You realize you forget it after. <laughs> so, so basically, this is, you, okay, click the forgot password link, right? right. That, that might be in the, um, wherever that is, on the homepage or something, right? Okay, so, or, or actually, Travis, you're right. Some people have it in the, in the login part where you forgot password, right? Yeah. So click login, click forgot password, right? And then from forgot password, what happens next after that? They would prompt you, enter your... Enter the new password. Your email. No, no they will let you enter a new password because you could be changing anybody's password from there. So they will yeah. normally ask you to enter your... Email, email address or username right. right and then they may ask you some security questions okay right so so basically the, this is like a line so first you enter your your username so if you click the login click the forgot password enter secure um enter your username it, it will validate if the user so after you enter the, the your username it will have a button a, a one like this here if the username is found it goes on to the next step if the username is not found, it goes back to, to the step to ask you to enter your username, right? Because it will tell you that it's an invalid username, right? Yeah. Good. Then the next step is it may ask you for a security question or it may send a code to a phone number and you have or, or a backup email address, depending on how you set it up, and you'll have to enter that code, right? So it prompt you for a code that was sent to your phone number, right? Yeah. And then you enter the code, or so, or it may prompt you for two things: either retrieve using the code, or retrieve using an email. Right? Send a code sent to email or code sent to phone, which is on this email is an alternative email, right? And this is a phone. And based on that, now when it from here you enter the, the code, and then it 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 um, asks you now to enter your new password and the confirm password, right? And then it logs you in. Good. Nice. Very up. So even if we're not doing that in our project, we could still put it down, right? Yeah. Remember, this is your idea. This is not what you actually build. What you build could be nothing like this. You probably don't even have that function, right? <laughs> Remember, you're designing. 
you're designing grand here. I keep telling you guys that don't limit this to what you build. This, That's on it too. <laughs> okay, okay. this don't reverse engineer what okay. you have in the application. Your application, okay. ignore your application when you're doing this. This is how you would wish your application could be, kind of thing. This is so, your so, wish list. So, so we need demo in. So let me ask the demo because they're looking for certain certain functionalities that we see we're going to implement. Right. Re remember, in your implementation, you will tell them what you actually, actually implemented. Okay. Right. And, and therefore, you, only, you could only show what you actually achieved, but there's nothing wrong with writing about things you wish you could put in. Right. This is your wish list, as I told you. Okay. 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 Right. Now, remember, guys, I've said that numerous times, right? But I'll keep saying it because I know it's easy to think, well, remember... <laughs> don't don't apologize because the write up is not meant to reflect your application. The write up is meant to reflect what you would like your application to look like, right? The application is what you what you are actually capable of, but the write up is what you could dream of, right? So your write up is your dream application, and the the application that you build is simply where you are at currently. Not where you will always be, but where you're currently at. I hope you understand the difference with the two, right? Cool. Okay, yeah. so now back to, to Barry. Barry, you had asked about deregistering from a course after it started. Do you allow that? After it starts, you can deregister? As it, as it is right now, I was just thinking about it. I wonder if somebody realized um, to get the, the course looked good at the beginning, I'm going to go through it. So like, uh, I don't think you can do that. Could you just leave it pending and you just go back, just like watching a movie on Netflix, right? If I stop watching, you know, you could either start over, yeah, continue from where you left off, you know, that kind of thing? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but I can't unwatch. That is it. Sure. Right. So the same thing for the course. Oh, right. Um, because it's only necessary. I don't think it's a bad idea. If, if it's so bad, so what you want to do is um, on enroll somebody because if too much time for us is almost like as if we still you know we'll forget everything that they're doing. Right. But can you can you can you redo a course that you've already done that you've completed in your system? Is it that you have to read you have to pay again to do it or once you've once you've enrolled in a course you always have access to that course? That is true. Yeah. Once well, once a pay you, you should have access to the course. So it all depends on how you do it, right, Neem? So in Barry case, if you always have access, then there's no need to deregister from the course, especially if it's if it's not a paid for course, right? For, um, now, yeah. in, in your case, Neems, if it is a course like on StudyNet where you have to register for the course for a thing, then you may allow deregistration, but the deregistration is what the administrator could be done. With. What you may have to do is you probably have to send an email outside of the system you know, like if you want to deregister from a course on StudyNet, you don't do that within StudyNet, right? What you do, you send an email to them, which is outside of the system, right? So there's no feature on StudyNet for you, the student, to deregister. You, you simply um, send an email to the university, and then what they will do now, they, they, as the administrator, have access to add and remove people from the course. So the administrator should be able to remove persons from the course. So in your case, Nima, if you want, you could do it as part of the system where the student could choose to deregister from a course, right? Uh, but, but the deregistration is within the course. You have an option somewhere to deregister, right? Now, the thing is, you, what you have to be careful about now in terms of those is deregistering after you finish a course. Because could, could you deregister after you finish? And that's not fair. Deregistration should only happen maybe within the first X number of weeks or something, right, of the course. But, but those are for course that you, everyone is doing together kind of thing. But if you want to... Huh? I'm probably for something that we're paying for. In four. Is in this system, are you paying for the course? No. No. So therefore, my, my recommendation is this could be something outside of the system, but the administrator, but however, the administrator has access to a feature within the system to view users on a course as well as remove users from a course. Right? Yeah. Okay. Any other function you'd like us to, to, to look at as well in terms of developing? 
Nalini, anyone? Anyone have a recommendation? Excuse for a feature that you'd like me to discuss? Camille? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Okay. I, right. uh, I, yeah. there's, this feature, there's this feature. Um, Let's say if you want um, oh, try not to. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Um, if let's say you want to add uh, payments to your learning management system, right? So I really want to let's say include. No, in fact, let's skip that one. If I want to add um, what's the name? Blue button, big. Um, big blue button. button. Big blue to button. Records, to record stuff in it. Like to do recordings and these things, or to right. have like a class or something. Right. Online. Like what we're doing right now. So this, like, we're using Zoom is integrated into your into your learning management system. Yes. So you have face to face classes, right? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, within your system, you wouldn't have you wouldn't call it big blue button necessarily, but within well, each course, yeah. you may have something called collaboration, right? So within within a unit. You have just like how you have within a, a particular course, you have units, assignments, etc. Right? You could have collaboration or conferencing or something like that. Sorry, not collaboration, yeah. sorry, conferencing, right? Yeah. Or right. And under conferencing, when you click on conferencing, you could you have this is where you're integrating Zoom or whatever with it here. But I don't think you need to actually build that. You could you could have it as a feature, etc. Right, and you could look at integrating Zoom or something. But you don't have to actually implement it itself, but you will just mention how you would incorporate, you know, incorporate it into it. Because the fact is, is that Canvas, which is what UH uses, uses Big Blue Button to do their their conferencing. Okay. All right. Okay. So, and okay, and that one, the payment one, so have to do the payment feature, like right, the, the PayPal or whatever is PayPal. Right. So you could have that in your design. You don't actually need to implement it, but you can write all about it as though it, it is going to be a feature. But ideally what you would need to do is um, you would eventually have to have some integration stuff with PayPal and with um, even with credit card thing to, to fail yeah. to work, right? And you could discuss what you've tried, et cetera, without completing it. Because you could get some code online and, and some discussion on these same things as well. So it might be a nice idea to consider. The reality is that you're not fully implementing it, but there's a lot of discussion on it. And those discussions are very healthy to incorporate in your write-up because it shows good research done. Okay. All right. In, the, in these other slides here, they are basically, um, these are other examples of, you know, activity diagrams that you have, right? So, but we, we would have discussed one or two there. You don't need an activity diagram for everything. You just do it for a couple of your major tasks. Right? Okay. So basically, um, yeah. So with the activity diagram, you have to do a write up on the flow of the activity. Um, you could briefly mention it in, in here at the start of the section, you discuss the role of the activity diagram, right? And you don't have to discuss the activity in the field, but what you do, you discuss the importance of activity diagram to it and discuss maybe discuss one of the process if you'd like. Right and and include the diagram for it, but briefly discuss the process of something. But you don't have to spend all the time discussing the process here. But you discuss more the role of the activity diagram in relation to your project, how you went about doing it, and the value it has added to your project, and give an example of an activity diagram. Um, the reason why I ask is because um, putting it down um, in words might be easier. To uh, first, before we actually create an diagram. Of course, so you can. Um, and therefore, you could probably put um, like a detailed description of the activities and the flow of the activities um, in an appendix. You can. I would have suggest at least one activity diagram in the main body. However, yeah, your best activity diagram should go in the main body if you have more than one. Okay. Okay, so guys, we've complete, come to the end now of this section here and this chapter. So our next class is next Thursday and we go on to the design chapter, right? 
So any other question before we close off today's section or today's class? No. I have a recommendation for how long this one is this chapter is supposed to be with. In terms of word count, there's no fixed word count for this chapter overall for the project, but I would anticipate that this chapter could be roughly 1,500 words or, or so. Okay. All right, guys. So I'm going to stop the recording here and we're going to end the meeting. Please note as well, um, ending the meeting doesn't mean end of communication with you. I would like if you, any anytime you're developing something, feel free to interact with me, to discuss, to share with me. You don't need to write an entire chapter to, to get feedback. I'm more than happy to discuss with you as you're going along the, the process as well. It's difficult to review an entire complete report at the end because it takes a lot of time. But if you, you want me to review bit by bit as you go through, I'm more than happy to do so with you guys as well, right? But utilize your time now to get as much as you can in terms of your write-up done as well, okay? Um, where, where, where will this be uploaded? Uh, wait, wait. Email it to me. No, 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 there's no the recording. We'll record it. Recording oh, I will email the recording to you. I'll upload it to YouTube and send you a link of the recording, right? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Have a good night, everyone. Take thank care. You. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Night, no, thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.